So good morning, everyone. Uh, we are delighted to see your participation and interest for today's webinar session. Myself, Parv, I'm a PhD student in mechanical engineering at Trinity College Dublin and also the host for this webinar. So a quick facts about our college. So Trinity College Dublin is one of the seven ancient research universities across UK and Ireland and is presently ranked as 101 globally uh, by QS World Rankings. So we have organized this webinar in collaboration with the undergraduate and postgraduate representatives of School of Engineering. And this is our very first webinar uh, of the engineering webinar series, which is titled as Nature Inspired Engineering. So for today's session, we are joined with two more co-hosts. And I have my colleague here, uh, Soumya, who is a PhD student in electronics department, and he shall be handling the question answer session for today's uh, webinar. And I'm also joined in with uh, Rucha, who is a undergraduate student and also the secretary for the Engineering Society. We shall be delivering a thank you note uh, towards the end of the session. So let's now introduce our distinguished guest speaker for this webinar, Professor Mark uh, Desvillis, and he's the Deputy Director of Research Institute of Sensors, Signal Systems, School of Engineering and Physical Sciences at Heriot Watt University, Scotland, UK. He also established the first nature-inspired manufacturing center in the UK in, in the year 2006. And uh, now I'd let Professor Mark to take over uh, to comment this session further. But before I just make a quick point here for all the attendees or the participants uh, uh, to make sure to go through the guidelines as stated in the chat box for the particular question and answer session, because we have arranged it in an order of, uh, uh, I mean, labeling your names uh, in the session so that we can arrange the question with the person, 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 uh, and directly connect with the speaker. And we will be also recording the webinar session so that uh, for future references and also uh, for later use. So I think Professor Mark, you can uh, start over from here. Okay, thank, thank you very much for uh, the introduction and uh, thank you very much for the Engineering Society of Trinity College Dublin to give me the occasion to present what I believe is a new, new branch of engineering uh, for the 21st century. Um, so uh, I am indeed Marc Desmulliers from Harriot Watt University and uh, I lead uh, a new center which is called a Nature Inspired Manufacturing Center. So I'm looking at how nature makes things and see if I can translate them. And I give you a very simple example uh, on the first slide here, where you see the dandelion seed on the left. And there is a very nice analogy you could make concerning the parachute on the right. And I'm going to show you later on that uh, the dandelion seeds can travel up to 150 kilometers and headed just by looking at burst of wind. And if anything, is, it is actually not a parachute. So I'm going to explain to you why new, new physics actually have been the new phenomena has been discovered with a dandelion scene and how it could impact, for example, for the, uh, the use of drones, uh, flying drones, etc. So, so some, you can make nice analogy, but you have very counterintuitive ideas of what the thing is, is happening. And, and I, I put, um, I put a, a citation from Pierre Gilles de Gênes, who uh, was a Nobel Prize winner uh, in uh, physics a few years ago. And he's saying that the comparison of a child's drawing to the Madonna by Leonardo da Vinci characterized our current understanding of nature. And if there is something I want to, to give as a message is that uh, when we are studying nature, we are actually all lifelong learning students. There's a lot to be learned on how nature works and how nature could be beneficial to us. Uh, now, if there is something we know with the pandemic is um, it is better to work with nature uh, than to work against nature. And I think more and more people realize that uh, working with nature uh, actually might be one of the solution to tackle the societal challenges we are facing today today and I'm going to show you some example of that. So let's go uh, in, the, uh, in the field itself. So what is the nature inspired engineering? Uh, for some reason I cannot, ah, here we go. So first of all, a, a definition of nature inspired engineering. Uh, 
it's a subset of what we call biomimetics. So biomimetics has a very precise definition provided uh, as an ISO standard. And uh, this is the ISO uh, mm -hmm. basically to, uh, from the, um, the committee, the 260th committee, and it's basically an interdisciplinary cooperation um, of uh, biology and technology and other fields of innovation uh, with the goal of solving practical systems through the functional analysis of biological systems, their abstraction into models, and the translation of this model to the solution. So there's a lot of words there, but some of them are quite important. Um, first of all, the one is to say that it, uh, biomimetics is not just technology, uh, it's not just biology, it's all the fields of innovation. Of innovation. And, and you can potentially uh, look at nature in order, for example, to solve uh, societal problems or to solve how a town could be working, a logistical problem, etc. So it is not just engineering. So, but so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to focus uh, specifically on engineering here. Okay. The second thing you might see is looking at practical problems. Now, there are two different ways of using um, the actual uh, biomimetics. You can either uh, look at it as an answer to an industrial requirement, and it's very much the engineering approach, but uh, biomimetics can also flourish as a, as a curiosity-driven exercise. So, for example, where a zoologist, a botanist, uh, finds the very peculiar uh, properties in nature and see whether or not that property could be used uh, for engineering. So you have two, two different approaches. You have the, which, which I will call the, uh, the biology push, and, and you have the, the market or the industrial pool. So you have two different ways of doing it. And most of the time, most of the work which has been done has been a biology push. So it has been a curiosity, and how to translate that, curious, that, that natural curiosity into something which could be useful uh, for uh, humankind. So most of it has been like that. Uh, and it's actually very difficult to uh, to have a methodology which, uh, from an industrial requirement, uh, allow you to find the natural solution which will be the best satisfying your requirement. Now, another thing I'm going to show you is um, another term which is quite important is functional analysis of biological system. So what it means is, it doesn't mean that when you are looking at a biological system, you have to think in terms of functions. It doesn't mean that. Um, and it's something that engineers are finding quite difficult to, to comprehend. Uh, nature doesn't work in terms of function. Uh, an animal didn't decide to grow legs in order to run. It was mostly a trial and error. And these trial and error are basically um, obey what we call the series of constraints. And so what you are really working is in terms of trade-off. Uh, so it's a very difficult thing to comprehend for an engineer. That is when you are looking at natural elements, uh, you try to look at them uh, as, as trade-off. And that trade-off would give you the very nice bridge to the engineering domain. I'm going to explain that in more details. But it's not easy because we are wide as engineers, we are right as in, in terms of thinking of functions. But that's not necessarily how nature is actually solving problems. So biomimetics, nature-inspired innovation, nature-inspired engineering, etc., is becoming increasingly popular. Uh, you can see the number of publications, and this is only uh, from 1995 to 2011 on the left. Uh, the number of publications and journals has exponentially increased. And it's very rare nowadays that you will not find an article which doesn't uh, explain a new phenomena based on natural effect. You know, you find that at least once a week. Uh, if you are looking at the number of papers in the middle, this number of papers is 2014 here, you see there are quite a lot of papers from chemistry and materials, slightly less on engineering and even less 
on cell and molecular biology. So most of the activity seems to be arising from, from engineering itself, but not from uh, biology or zoology itself. Yeah? So that's also a trend which is, uh, which is happening. Now, if you're looking at terms of contracts, uh, sorry, in terms of countries, and that is a, a slide on the right hand side, you see that Europe is actually in a very good position where the, uh, the, large, uh, the, the largest countries dominating the field are Germany, United Kingdom, France and Italy. But you have a huge increase from China and also the United States. So they have a very well established center there. But we are in a, in a reasonably good situation as far as the actual uh, prominence of activities is concerned. So moving forward, how will you be finding a solution in nature? Yeah. Now this is a very nice, very nice presentation, a very nice, uh, what we call the tree of life. And uh, this has been uh, created back in 2008 uh, by Leonard Eisenberg, and what it gives you, it gives you basically the replication from the, uh, the, the prime, primeval soup, shall we say, uh, about uh, 3.8 3. Uh, billion years ago to today, basically the, uh, the Homo sapiens. So it, it shows you the, the kind of ramification you, you have. And what I have um, given you here is basically the an example is the four the four steps for the actual creation of plants so you start with photosynthesis which was about uh, 3.2 billion years ago then something happened in uh, 440 million years ago roughly which was the creation of stem and leaves then something happened 380 million years ago, creation of seeds, and the flower, the flowers appeared in 230 million years ago, and that could, that defined basically the, the the range of the plants. And you from the root, you have a lot of ramifications, and this is a way we keep on and we still do it uh, classifying. Uh, natural objects yeah so wh whenever you have to study nature you always have to t take a, a step backwards and then try to explain to yourself how, how did we how do we classify objects how do we do things well, what is the reason we we are doing things in that way and not in another way so the way the uh, the classification is being done actually stem from uh, two people. One is what's called a Linnaeus, which was for the plants, and the other person is basically Darwin. And the the branching of uh, the different species that you has, you have seen in the previous slide is what we call a taxonomy. Okay, so this is basically let's call it a, a, a classification. Uh, and taxonomy is done using the principle of similarity. So if one animal A looks very similar to an animal B, you will say that it is a, he is a brother or he is a cousin, and therefore they must have, back in time, they must have a, basically a common ancestor. So this is a way we decide to, to classify um, uh, animals and plants, etc. And as I said, that came from Darwin, the chapter 13 of his uh, one of his novel B, 1837. And today, uh, we still we're still doing that. We are still classifying uh, animals according to this uh, nom to this taxonomy. But there was no reason we want to, we could have chosen something else. For example, you could have a taxonomy based on uh, functionality. That is. Uh, uh, for example, I want to classify uh, plants according to their uh, degree of poison. That could, that could have been a, a, another classification, but that is not the way 
basically uh, the the system has been working uh, so that so we have a huge heritage uh, you have to take into account when you are looking at, uh, at taxonomies is what i'm trying to say so so the thing we we having here is uh, for some just a second just take some time. yeah is that uh, our current classification of the living world is very much based on this darwin win principle okay so the similarity of traits is called the phenetics. But there is another thing which has been happening more recently is also the, uh, the, the similarity in the genetics. That is uh, looking at not just how objects look like from a visual point of view or a, or a functional point of view, but also uh, how close they are from their genetic point of view. And uh, this uh, comparative analysis of the evolution is what we call the phylogeny. So I'm, I'm introducing a lot of terms here. Sorry about that, but that's, at least you will understand where I'm coming from. Now, that taxonomy actually might help us as well. This is one way uh, museums, for example, can help towards um, uh, natural inspired engineering. Because very often, when you have plants or animals which are very similar by nature and by similar again i mean not only in terms of trade but in terms of genetics you can find that this uh, these two plants or these two animals could provide an answer for a specific requirement yeah so that's something which is quite interesting. So sometimes you are looking at one specific plant which provides the answer you need as far as the industrial requirement is concerned. But for some reason, that plant is difficult to find or uh, it takes a lot of process step to, to extract uh, what you want from that plant. But very often, if you look at the cousin, you might be able to find similar properties, but maybe further advantages, that is the plant could be easier to, to get, or it's a more common plant than what you have. So, so that's something that you might want to, to consider as well when you are looking at a taxonomy. For some reason, ah, here we go. So if I look at some observation of this tree of life here, the, the phylogeny is, is very useful for what we call for curiosity driven research. That is for when you are looking at uh, properties of animals or properties of plants, irrespective of what is the industrial requirement. So that is a very, very useful concept you can use. For example, the lotus leaf, um, people notice, uh, I think it was back in the 60s, that the lotus leaf has some very interesting hydrophobic surfaces. So that was a functional property. So hydrophobic surfaces is a surface which basically repel liquids, hence the name phobic, hydrophobic. The surface which attract liquid will be called hydrophilic. And that also, uh, it, so not only is a very interesting concept, but it also has some self-cleaning properties. And that was an industrial requirement. So, so there are some uh, requirement where you want objects whose services basically doesn't is not being soiled over time so the way it tends to work is you have basically uh, the drop of liquid which will uh, not only uh, stain the surface but will take with it uh, particles take with it some dust etc and therefore leave leave the actual surface uh, totally clean okay actually it's a uh, this uh, lotus leaf is one of the most common examples we find in, uh, uh, in uh, nature inspired engineering. And the original discovery was not done with lotus leaves, it was done with cabbage leaf. But the person who created that, uh, uh, who discovered that thing, saw that lotus leaf would be much more, shall we say, uh, sellable in terms of ideas than just a cabbage leaf. So we decided to switch to the, to the lotus leaf. So that is, a, that is for the, uh, the, the history. The, 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 the... 
But doing engineering-driven biometrics is actually much harder. So you have, in a, you have a, a, an industrial, an engineering requirement. How can you find the right plant, the right uh, phenomena within the plant or the right animals in order to satisfy that, uh, that industrial requirement? This is much harder. And the concept of engineering function is not a very useful tool for exploring the living world. Uh, that that is a natural tool that we will be using. Ah, there's something sharing this. Oh, okay. So there is something. Um, it's engineering. Um, uh, is not a very useful useful tool for exploring the living world. Uh, it's our natural inclination, as engineer, as engineer, to think in terms of function, but that's not a very useful things to do. Yeah. So. The, the the reason is uh, nature doesn't uh, think in terms of functions. It's not the way uh, natural plants are being made. So, for example, if I were to look at a self-cleaning requirement, you know, coming back to my uh, initial requirement, I want to have, I want to find plants to use self-cleaning requirement. I have many different possibilities. For example. I could look at the digestion. So in the uh, gastrointestinal tract, there is one layer, which is called a mucus layer, which allows you to, uh, to do the digestion of the, of the food and transmit uh, the right um, constituent of the food uh, down to the human body. So, so basically, uh, th th and this uh, this mucus has a function also to to clean the the, the gastrointestinal tract. You could look at um, structural hydrophobia. So you have uh, aquatic plants which have uh, uh, hydrophobic surfaces, um, which uh, you could uh, you could use. You could also look at uh, chemical hydrophobia. So you have uh, some plants, uh, xerophytes, which live in a very dry environment, which has also uh, such uh, hydrophobia. But which one are you going to choose? Suddenly, when you look at the requirement, one given requirement, industrial requirement, you have a multiplicity of possible choices. Now, the key is, first of all, well, how do you find all these natural choices? Okay, how are you going to do that? And this is where you definitely need some biologist, you need some zoologist, some botanist, because they have a huge experience to do that. But is there tools which allow you to do that? And by the way, Google will not give you all the answers, whatever you think. Yeah, they will not give you all these answers. And there are tools which exist, for example, ask, asknature.org, but it's very much for the public. It's not really a be I be maybe a little bit content, contentious here, but it's not really a great tool if you want to do um, nature inspired engineering you know, on a scientific basis, because it will give you only a very limited number of potential solutions. So that's the first thing. So given an industrial requirement, how are you going to find all the natural solutions? Bearing in mind that earth engineers are not necessary biologists, botanists, zoologists, etc. Now, given the list of candidates, found in nature, which one is the best? This is another thing. So how can you, uh, how are you going to make a decision to find out whether or not the one, the, among, for example, here, these four, these three possibilities, which one is actually the, the one to use? So again, there's a lot of knowledge, there's a lot of the methodology still to be invented. And, and that's the reason what I'm saying that the nature in spine engineering is very much a new field of engineering for the 21st century. We haven't yet created all the tools necessary to fully answer the question. So this field of engineering is a, what we call a work in progress. Yeah. Now, you can, re, you can proceed by homology with neighboring species, for example. So, so basically, uh, I'll give you an example, which was a little bay, a little berry, 
which has a, a, apparently some um, uh, uh, properties for uh, acting against some form of cancers. So you have the the Taxus brevifolia, but it's a very it's a berry which is very difficult to find, very difficult to extract. For example, the chemical compound which could be used for pharmaceutical uh, pharmaceutical uh, solutions. But if you are looking at the neighbor, that is a cousin, uh, you will have another plant which is called the bacata. Uh, and the bacata happens to have the same biological content, but that berry is actually very easy to process. It is a common berry you can find uh, with not a problem at all, etc. So, so this is a possibility you can still use from an engineering point of view, you can still use uh, the phylogeny. So you proceed here by homology or proceed by analogy. That is, you are looking at spaces with, which are completely unrelated to one another, not too far away from the species you are looking at in the life of tree. Okay. And there is an example of the, between the Nelumbo plant. So the Nelumbo plant is, uh, is basically the lotus leaf. But you have also another plant which has a very good hydrophobic surfaces, which is a Salvinia fern. So this is another possibility. And you can learn by looking in more details at the structure, the surface of this plant, which one do you think is the best for you? By seeing, by, by looking at how difficult this, uh, the pattern, for example, uh, would be to, replic uh, to be uh, replicated in, uh, uh, on an engineering surface. Or what you can also do is something which is completely different is looking at transposition to other functions as well. This is another, another way to do that. So what you need really is you need a kind of ontology of function and structure uh, coupled to phylogeny. Okay. Now we are talking about functions from an engineering point of view, as I said, not necessarily as, as a um, nature, nature point of view. Okay. At the moment, nobody is doing such a thing. So uh, people might be uh, familiar with uh, the term ontology. So ontology is not a database. No, a database is a static way of encoding information. Ontology is a dynamic, a dynamic way. Okay. So I would say database is to information what ontology is to knowledge. Okay, that's another way of defining it. An ontology is basically a dynamic thing. So it's a way of encoding information so that when you are questioning uh, this, uh, this code, suddenly the information, the framework of that information is dynamically reconfigured to provide you the right information for the question you are asking in the first instance. It's not easy to create that. It's, the ontology is, uh, is a domain of uh, computer science, uh, but it has been used uh, for engineering. It has been used for medical application but it has hardly been used for uh, uh, biomimetics. Uh, there are tools which allow you to, to, manage, to do that, but they, it's not a very easy thing to, uh, to encode the information with. So as I said, the, the last bullet point could be a PhD in itself. Nobody has been doing that at the moment. So let's at uh, an example of a, a multifunctional living organism. So let's suppose you are applying blindly your engineering approach uh, to, to solve a problem, yeah? So what you would like to have is you will have to have, I, I want to have a noiseless, dexterous, accurate flying system. That's what I want to have. And I want to have uh, also, uh, that system should have a harmer and you can basically use a hammer to ram into objects and you will have a very uh, un unrivaled grinding properties. And you would end up, you know, if you do that blindly looking at the tree of life, you will end up what we call this uh, Volpertinger. Uh, so it's a bit of a joke here. Um, uh, it's basically a, a, a kind of uh, chimeric animals, uh, which is also called the Horhack or the Turingen Rasselbock, or the North Asian Dildap, or the Swedish Skader, or the French Dahu as well. So you have this kind of, if you were to apply it uh, blindly, your industrial requirement, and you take the best thing coming from nature, this is uh, the system you really, really like to, to build. 
Now, obviously, I'm sure we can do better than that, yeah? Uh, so let's look at uh, in details of how we can uh, tackle the problem. So the key lessons again, coming to uh, what we just uh, learned concerning the tree of life. Uh, it's a problem-driven, yes, problem-driven biometric research is often, very often, an adventitious and serident between activity. So what I mean by that is very often the you look at a biological object and you end up looking at possibilities uh, that how that the properties of that biological object could satisfy some uh, engineering requirement. And but what you end up doing is you tend to have some uh, what we call anthropomorphic application uh, and also what we call theological interpretation of the properties of living in engineering. So theological interpretation means that you are putting your um, your, your engineering functions into interpreting what the living organism properties have. Okay, so this is this is this is very difficult actually you know, to try to avoid this kind of engineering approaches. So what you need is you need to find a, a, what we call a meta methodology, which facilitates the translation of requirement across the domains. And this is the work I've been doing for the last five to six years. I'm going to explain to you what I mean by that. So how you should really handle the translation between nature and engineering. And you need to find method and preferably automated method with the help of botanists and zoologists to find, to facilitate what we call the findability or the biological concept. That is how, how the, the ability to find those concepts the recognizability that is you can recognize those concepts which could be useful for the engineers and the understandability that is once you have found them you have recognized them uh, can you really understand them what they mean for engineers so you have you have to obey these three properties whenever you find some uh, some method which could be useful for nature inspired engineering now there has been a lot of work being done on that you know it's uh, that has been started for i would say the last 10, 15 years, and you have about uh, 13 different uh, problem-driven processes which have been uh, created. You have 22 continuously researched tools out of uh, 54 which have been created. Um, by tools, I mean either computer tools or let's call them paper tools. Okay, so so you see on the on the left hand side, I've given you 22 research process. So one is uh, called Dane, the other one is called Safai, number 11 and number 12. Uh, you have the concept of taxonomy, and you have the 21, uh, the Ask Nature, which is probably the best known example you will find from a bi biomimicry 3.8 Institute, which is very simple to understand. And you have all these others, which you might not be familiar with, such as the CW, the TC method, the LP method, KLP, and so on and so forth. So, and this method can be applied in different ways. There's so different, uh, different levels of the methodologies, either as a problem analysis or how you can extract the technical problems, how you can transpose them to biology, how you can identify the different models, the selection of those models, the abstraction of these strategies, and the transposition to the technology. So if there is one thing I want to say is there is not one research tool which is used for all the different uh, design process. There's a problem solving process. You need to find different tools. There are different tools which can be used. And, and we came up um, with some colleagues in France to this, uh, to this concept here. And what we notice is the concept of trade-off is a concept one should be using when you go from biology to engineer, because engineers understand trade-off and so do biological people. Now, if you read, if you read a biological text, if you read a botanic, botanic, uh, botanical text or zoological text, the way it is written is very different from an engineering article. Botanists, zoologists tend to describe things. They do not tend to explain how 
devices, how parts of a, a plant, etc., works. It's not the way they do. They do things. Their, their brain is not why the same. Then the, the background knowledge, the educational knowledge is not the same as engineer. But they, what they will be describing is not only the parts of, of the, the different traits, but they also will be describing um, the different trade-offs happening. For example, they will be, if you take the example of the archer fish, they will uh, define a trade-off between velocity and precision. Uh, so they will, um, they, they, if you are defining, for example, if they are describing a bird, they will be looking at the span of the wings versus the energy needed to fly. So, and that, uh, that is different trade-offs. And it is this concept of trade-off, which allows you to do the bridge from engineering to biology and vice versa. Okay. So let's take an example. Let's suppose I start with an engineering problem that I want to solve. So I, I am on the step A here. So what I need to do is I need to abstract the actual um, actual uh, problems. So to try basically to, you know, if you have a, something which is very specific in terms of problem, you make an abstraction of it in the engineering domain. What does it, what do you really need? In, in terms of um, term of requirement, what is the actual issue there? And when you do that, once you have done that, you are going to look at something called the trade-off. So you're going to go from A to B. So you go to your external represent the idea, and you're going to to look at the actual trade-off you are trying to satisfy through that function. And once you have this kind of trade-off, which you have abstract in, uh, in general terms, you, are, you can start mining all the different text you're going to get in the biological field. Uh, and uh, you, you can look at um, trying to extract the different trade-offs in all the different fields. And you need computer tools in order to be able to do that, or you need to have a lot of time and patience in order to be able to do that, and a lot of friends in uh, among uh, your botanist and zoology uh, colleagues. And when you have done that, you have been able to aggregate a lot of data. So you you have selected maybe 15, 20, 30 different possible uh, animal or botanic model, and then you're going to abstract the knowledge coming from that. You're going to say, okay, uh, there is some trade-off, but what is really the trade-off there? What are they managing to do? And once you have been able to do that, you're going to talk, obviously, to the domain expert, so talk to zoologists, etc., to see whether or not this abstraction here corresponds to the abstraction you had in engineering domain. And then you're going to select one or two candidates, and you're going to transport that knowledge into some prototypes and to see whether or not those prototypes are actually working. And maybe they might not. Maybe you might need to refine the model and you go again through the loop, okay? So this is a kind of system you're going to, to work on, okay? So the, the key concept here is to look at trade-off in order to be able to do that bridge between engineering and, and biology. And in order to do that very quickly, you need to have what, uh, what we call CAP tool, computer, computer aided, uh, biomimetic tools in order to support that, and and this is a, this is work in progress, not only from my research group but also from other research groups in the world, uh, in France, for example, in order to define those tools, so that you know we have hopefully in ten years time we'll have the equivalent of Cadence, or Sage, uh, Sage tools or Console tools uh, in, uh, or HFSS and so. Forth. Uh, engineering field, but we have it for that specific field of research, field of engineering. So let's see how I can apply that to uh, the pantograph. So uh, that, that was an example which has been used uh, uh, for the bullet train, the Shikansen series 500. So the problem was the following. Uh, the pantograph is a, is a system which allows you to get electricity from uh, bullet trains, so very high-speed trains. 
Uh, and the problem the people were facing with this pantograph is that they, need, they tended to be very noisy. Doing a lot of, they, they have a lot of noises and they also, they, they, they tended to be uh, uh, not, uh, the profile wasn't very much uh, aerodynamic as well. And there was a lot of vibrations uh, associated with it. So they ended up from this uh, uh, model you see on the left to another model, which is very different from uh, the one you have on the right. Yes, yeah, so you can see that model. Now you see that model has some very spe peculiar thing. It has some indentation. It has some uh, some uh, protrusion here, and the shape is is look like an oblong shape. So if you were looking from above it will look like a, a penguin. And there's a very good reason for that I'm going to explain, yeah? So how did they come from this system to this system? Now, they didn't use the technique uh, that I'm describing because that was done uh, at least 30 years ago, but you can see uh, the, the way of thinking uh, behind it. So basically the problem the problem was the pantograph generates too much noise. What can we do about it? So they say, okay, well, the problem is, let, let's, do, let's do the abstraction of the problem. Is it really the noise a problem? Or is the noise a consequence of an underlying problem? And they say, actually, yes, there were a lot of vibration. And those vibrations introduce the noise. So the abstraction of the problem is, how can I reduce the vibration? It's not, how can I reduce the noise? is how can I reduce the vibration? Then they went to the translation of the biology. Well, and they say, okay, well, where, where does this vibration come along? It, it, it comes along because of the turbulence. As a bullet train is going to uh, 200, uh, 250 miles an hour, I have a problem concerning the turbulence. So the vibration as introduced by the flow of air, basically hitting the pantograph, vibrating the pantograph and generating too much noise. So how can I reduce that as uh, that turbulence and the concept of turbulence is a concept which is quite well known in uh, in the biological field so they were looking at pertinent biological models which could be used so how can i basically uh, create have some structure which allows me to to manage that turbulence and they were they selected some biological models and one of them why is the primary phaser of the all? Now, I'm going to explain later on what the all is, but the all is one of the most silent animal, uh, flying animals that exist. And the reason behind it is, the if you look carefully at the wings of the all, it's got some serration at the end of it. And those serration actually reduce the actual turbulence. And it reduces the turbulence by creating micro vortices. So instead of having one large turbulence, which generate a lot of vibrations, therefore a lot of noise, is using the principle of divide and conquer. So all this very little serration will create micro vortices, but very much less turbulence than one big vortex. And that's the reason you see on this uh, uh, pentagraph on the right, all this little protrusion here, which will be used in order to create these micro vortices, therefore reducing the noise. So how to create the serration? So how, how do we do that? And the idea is to create, instead of doing some serrations, they created, as I said, these little, little triangles here, which will create these vortices. By the way, if you are flying or Hopefully you'll be flying very soon, like we all would like to. Uh, look carefully at the wings of the Boeings. You will see some little triangles on the wings of the Boeings. So little protrusion. And those protrusion are exactly meant to reduce the turbulence. And it's not to decrease the noise, it's to basically decrease the consumption of kerosene, of fuel, okay? And any percentage of fuel being saved is low money being saved for the airline companies. So have a look at it. Uh, when you have the time uh, during your next trip to uh, Spain or whatever. So let's look at now a totally different thing. Let's look at the biomaterials. Okay, so what I'm going to look is 
the biomaterial is a key key feature of nature and i'm going to show you that uh, biomaterials have very different uh, very different characteristic uh, compared to man-made materials and actually they that helps us to uh, to actually um, uh, find analogies which could be useful for engineering application. So I'm going to look at the chemical composition, then I'm going to use as the hierarchy of structures. I'm going to look at the multifunctionality aspect. And also because it is really my field, I'm going to look at the manufacturing challenges behind the manufacture of these materials. Okay. So I'm going to look at that in details one after another. First of all, the chemical composition. If you look at the Mendeleev table, which is, by the way, is another taxonomy, but the taxonomy used by chemists, we are using easily, I would say, three quarters of the Mendeleev table when we look at engineering material, very easily. Whereas nature, using a very small palette of materials, they are using it in vengeance, you know? They are using it very heavily. So looking at the characteristic of biomaterial, if you look at the earth crust, you will have oxygen being used quite abundantly, you then followed by silicon, aluminium, iron, calcium, and sodium in decreasing order of use or percentage. If you look at the planet, you will have again oxygen, magnesium, silicon, iron, aluminium, and calcium. But if you look in the world, you will have what we call chomps. It's called chomps. It is carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus. A little bit of iron on the side, maybe, you know, a um, little bit of compound, but the main six elements are given there. Okay. And yet you have such a multiplicity of different structures. You know, what is so different between a, a bone, for example, and a bamboo? You know, they look like very different materials, but they are using a very similar uh, range of uh, bio, bio materials. Yeah. So you have four different families. Uh, so you have organic molecules, which are using that. You have amino acid and proteins, and you have cells, and all this will use predominantly these six materials. Now, we are living in a world where it is more and more difficult to extract uh, materials for engineering and more and more costly. We already have lost some materials such as hafnium. Hafnium is very difficult to extract. In uh, 50 years time, it will cost us 100 times more, or sorry, 100,000 times more it will cost us to extract copper than it is today. So obviously we cannot leave, you know, it's a big societal challenges, the paucity, the paucity of raw material and the, the difficulty it will be to use material we take for granted, such as platinum, for example, palladium, tantanate, uh, iron, copper, uh, compared to, you know, maybe in, in 100 or 200 years ago. So we have to think very carefully, how can we, give, how can we get wrong this traditional material we take for granted? And recycling will not be the panacea. You know, it will be one step, for, one step in, but it will not be the, the normal solution. So we need to find different ways. And there are ways to look at um, nature on how to help us basically, and also nanotechnology, I should say, how to help us replacing the raw materials that we will find very difficult and very expensive to extract. It also something else the biomaterial do uh, is uh, what we call the low earth mixture. So I've plotted here uh, or have extracted from a, a paper two plots which are called HB, HB plot. So if this plot are so basically, Michael Ashby from Cambridge uh, created a system of uh, plots where you can put on the horizontal axis and vertical axis some uh, properties you really want to uh, uh, to characterize. So, so for example, you have a specific thickness here uh, on the left-hand side and on the x-axis, and you have 
specific strength on the vertical axis. Now, what I have represented in blue are engineering material you will find, like ceramics, maple and alloys, porous ceramic, polymers, but also wood is indicating. What is also indicated is the different material you find, for example, in the spider. So that would be this pink six here. You can see, by the way, the spider, the silk of the spider comes in seven different, uh, seven different ways. Either you are dealing with a uh, silk or cocoon silk or a dragline silk. The dragline silk is a silk you will find on the spider web. And you see the range of specific stiffness and specific strength is quite wide here. But you will find so collagen. So collagen, you will find that in bone here. The skin here is on the on the left hand side. You will find also um, bones. So you will have compact bones here, and you will have cancellous cancellous bone. And you will see that you can you can see here that on average you will find that the kind of metal will cover a fair proportion of what basically engineering material can provide as well. Now, there's something more extraordinary happening with biomaterials. Yeah, and this is what we call the law of mixture. So let's take, for example, bone. Bone is made of hydroxyapatite and also collagen. If you look at collagen and the hydroxyapatite, you will see that they have, they, they, they occupied very different domain here, very different region of the plot here, given on the right-hand side with respect to young modulus on the x-axis and fractured toughness on the right axis. But if you combine them, and there's a very specific way to combining them, suddenly you have a structure which has a much higher structural toughness than collagen or hydroxyapatite taken separately. Yeah. The same with nacre. So, so basically nacre, you will have the nacre protein itself here and the aragonite, but when you bind them together, you get a material which a very high uh, fracture toughness. By the way, uh, future composite and uh, composite do also works with the law of mixture. So an example has been the alumina PMMA. If you combine PMMA, which is a classic uh, uh, polymer material you use, for example, in, uh, in microfluidics, combine that with alumina, which you will be using in low temperature co ceramic, for example, or MMIC devices, you get a composite which has a much higher fracture toughness than both of them taken individually. So that's something people then will have to learn is you can combine materials and create a composite material which has a much higher, much, yeah, much better properties or higher properties than those taken individually. There's something else that biomaterials are very good at. And it's something for us engineers we are not very good at. It's what we call the multi-scale multi structuration. If you think about it, when we design a car or when we design a chair, um, or something metallic in general, we tend to take the material, tend to purify them, and tend to mix them again to make an alloy, and then we tend to proceed in a modular fashion. Now, nature doesn't work like that. Nature takes what is available with all the, uh, the deficiency, the imperfections you will find, but what they do, and they do not work in a modular fashion. They work in a multi-scale structural fashion. So I'll give you an example of the bone on the top and the bamboo at the bottom. You can have up to seven level of functionalities. And this is a multi-scale functionality. So you go from the collagen molecule, which is a nanometer scale, and you will end up with the actual bone itself. And you will go through seven layers seven different ways of structuring your devices. And as you go from the left to the right, the scale is obviously increasing. And it is a combination of this different structure which creates a unique property of the bone. 
okay? No, the way it is done, the way it is, I'm going to explain to you the way, the way, how do you end up having this kind of structure there? And there's still a lot of progress to be made. It's not fully understood. Why is a bone structured in such a way? And the same happened with the bamboo, when you will start from the cellulose to the microfibril, the fibril matrix, that will be part of the cells as a layer of the cell walls. And these cell walls, we have very specific holes here. They are very, it's a, basically, it's a very nice combination of toughness with respect to flexibility and also energy impact uh, compensation. So it's a very, very clever structure, actually, when you look at it very correctly. Bamboo is still used in scaffolding in Asian country. It's a very, very, very strong material for uh, to create a scaffolding, which can be 50 meters, 50 meters high very easily. So it's still a structure which is used for engineering application itself. Now, there is some lot, a lot of work. People, engineers and, uh, and biochemists, uh, material scientists have been trying to find out a little bit more, what is so specific about biomaterials? And there is an interplay between diversity and universality. So what is happening is, first of all, out of a very limited palette of material, you can create a huge diversity of different biopolymer. Okay, you have a lot of choice. Look at it as a Lego, Lego type of assembly. You start with the basic bricks of the Lego, but you end up with creating all possible configuration with this Lego. So this here, polypeptide. But when you have that, how do you assemble the bigger part? And this is where you have here some very little diversity. That is, there are only a very, very specific configuration, uh, no more than 10 configuration on how you're going to assemble this long chain of polymers into uh, uh, some um, uh, larger configuration. Okay. So this is where suddenly the diversity is becoming low, but the university is becoming high. And same when you go to the next cap, that is a different way you're going to assemble, for example, in that particular case, a triple helix. So you have only four or five configuration on how to assemble that. Again, low diversity, but high universality. But once you have that, the way that you will find it in a very, um, you will find it in a very different kind of examples. You will find it in the bone, this kind of configuration. You will find it in the cornea, find it in the tendon, etc. So this is where the diversity is increasing, but the universality is uh, is decreasing. So you have this interplay between universality and diversity, and you have also multi modalities, multi parameters, and it is something that people are, especially in sensors, are working quite uh, quite uh, actively. A given surface, so let's uh, say, say such a surface like that here, could be used for having permeability, having some wetting properties, different wetting. It could be used for adhesion or not. It could be used for self-cleaning properties. It could be used also for optical properties, mechanical properties of thermal dissipation. So suddenly you see that this kind of surfaces, which is a, a, a very simple surface, has different functionalities, different modalities and different parts. And you will find that for the skin, you will find that in the bark, the leaf, the cuticle, the shell. So there's a variety, variety of functionalities for a given structure as well. This is a reason you have to be very careful, as I said, when you are looking at a structure, a given structure could have different functionality. Yeah. So it might be led into a dead ends if you start with functionality from uh, in the actual uh, natural world. Now, there was a very nice work done by Marcus Buller, uh, who invented the term materiomics, and I quite like that term, because what he was able to find out is if you are looking at this multifunctionality, you can see here, looking at the scale, there is a, what, we, what he called the golden triangle. So what is happening is the material blocks 
if I take that here, the, mat the, the, the building blocks at one scale is basically obeying a, an interplay between the property of these blocks, the way it is being processed and the way it is being configured. And that goes in hand together. And that creates a certain function of this meta block. And that meta block will be the building block of the next one. And the thing is repeating itself time and time again. Now, what is also very interesting is there is some active sensing, some feedback loop, for example, for adaptation, for repair, etc. So there's a lot of information going from one level onto another. At the moment, nobody is able to properly model that from an engineering point of view. So again, this is a field of research which needs to be done. Maybe multi-agent modeling might be a, a, a good way to go forward, in my view. But again, this is, an, a, this is a PhD in itself. And how can you model this kind of multi-scale system bearing into account that you have embedded information which go from one level to another, one scale to another? This is very different from engineering, what you're seeing here. Another characteristic of biomaterials is what I called heat beat treat. Now, if you look at the history of mankind, you, we started with stone, the manufacturing, the, the modeling of stone, so the, the Paleolithic age, the Neolithic age, and it was a temperature, room temperature process, 20 degrees. Then we ended up with copper, bronze at 600 degrees. Then we carried on with iron, and we needed to have 1,000 degrees. I think you all recognize the Eiffel Tower, I hope. And then we end up with silicon at 700, 1,700 degrees. Our, there's something quite remarkable with the evolution of mine kind of engineering is our mastering of materials has gone hand in hand with our mastering of increasing or to, to deal with increasing temperature in our processes. Okay, this is, this is one of the characteristic of what we have been doing with materials. And yet, nature doesn't work like that. Network, uh, net, uh, the, the, we work at ambient temperature, nature work at ambient temperature and ambient pressure. For example, an example here is a glass. It's a, a glass. It's called a diatoms, which you will find in water. And they are very, very nice structure. It's actually a three-level structure. So you see, for example, some small holes here. And inside, you will have smaller holes. And inside, you will have even smaller holes. Yeah. And that is, a, that is glass. It's a glass material silicate, not to name it. And it... Uh, and I think it was back in the 60s, the 50s, the 60s, a French, a French scientist called Village uh, found out a way of creating what he calls soft chemistry, of creating glass at very low temperature. And it, it was inspired from the diatoms into doing that. Now, why is it interesting? How can, how, why is it interesting to have glass at very low temperature? Because then you can start putting organic element into the glass. And these organic elements will not be burnt at this thousand degrees, for example, when you do traditional glass. So you can create additional functionality for that. Another example is a silk. So this is an example of the silk here, the spider, uh, of the spider, which is happening again at room temperature. And ceramics, the abalone here, or the, 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 the mother of pearl, or the nacre. And it's only recently, just less than two years ago, people have been able to replicate ceramics um, coming from, uh, uh, from nacre ceramics, which are as good as, for example, here the abalone. So there is a branch of manufacturing strategy that needs to be handled with it. So how are we going to do that? Well, one, one aspect you can use is uh, self-assembly. And there's a very nice work done, for example, by the WIS Institute, uh, Harvard Institute, MIT Institute, and, and various uh, uh, high high level uh, technological institute to look at different ways to do self-assembly, like nature does, okay? So some nice example given by, a uh, nice review by, uh, by Raman in the nature communication, for example, you can have a look at it. You can use additive manufacturing. It's a, it's a paper, actually, I recently 
uh, is recently been published. Uh, for example, we have been using uh, extract of spinach to grow metal onto plastics. So this is an example here, and we replicated just for the sake of it, a, 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 nice, a nice little butterfly here. Um, so you can use additive manufacturing technique in order to do that. Or you can use a micro and nano manufacturing technique. So this is an example I did a few years ago uh, where you can uh, manufacture, I, I use here something called uh, uh, um, hydroelectrodynamic instability patterning. So using uh, um, Coulombic forces to grow these, to grow these uh, patterns here, which are little, little pads, or little um, like you find in the octopus, which are totally hollow inside. You can see an example, and you manufacture that in one process steps. So you manufacture the actual device, and you manufacture the hollow inside the actual structure in just one go. So you do not need a, a packaging step to do that. Again, I give you an example of uh, where you can find the or how the thing is being manufactured. So there's a lot of manufacturing strategies that you could implement in order to recreate this beautiful uh, this beautiful structure you find here on the on the left hand side here. By the way, people do not understand yet why do you have uh, this kind of rosette across this sphere. No, nobody understands that yet. Now, if you look again, and this is some work that my colleague Julian Vincent did in the uh, back in 2006, we are dealing with different ways of um, using uh, the various um, information energy time space uh, from the engineering to the natural solution. So on the left, this is the way we tend to do. We tend to spend a lot of, for example, at the micron scale, we spend a lot of energy in order to ma manufacture micro scale devices. We do not make use too much of time or space. We are taking consideration of the material itself, the substance itself. There's absolutely no information whatsoever we are using. Okay, all the information is coming from the outside in. Nothing is coming from the material itself out. Yeah, and as you go to larger scale, to the meter, etc., suddenly things are changing. You use less energy because you assemble things mostly. Since I've been, remember, we tend to do things in a modular fashion. Space is becoming quite important. We are taking a lot of time in understanding where parts are going to be fit in. Again, material is important, but structure is becoming more and more important as well as the configuration of all the parts are where are going to be. And you start putting in information, for example, using electronics to see how one part is going to drive another. If you look at nature on the right hand side, it's something completely different. We are working at low temperature and low pressure. So therefore energy is very minor here, but we are taking a lot of configuration to the structure. Remember, I was telling you this level of functionalities. Substance, yes, we take care into account, but not to a large information, a larger extent. And here information is important. It's actually increasing as you go to larger and larger uh, system. So the way, nature is using all these parameters is very different from what the engineering is using them. So the key lesson for biomaterials is that we are living in a world which makes a small part of mat uh, the world which is using a small part of materials. We tend to work in terms uh, of hierarchical, mesoscopic materials. We gain new functionality as you go to high order assembly and we make a greater use of information content. Okay, so that's a key lesson you can learn from the biomaterials. So let's look at some examples. The, the most emblematic example is Velcro. You, you all heard about Velcro. If there's one, one item that people are talking about is Velcro. It's starting in 1941. It was basically Georges de Mistral, which was a Swiss engineer. He was basically getting his dog in the, in the Swiss Alp. And he noticed that there were some cockle burr flowers, the burr of Bordeaux, which were sticking on the dog fur. And he spent 10 years to try to refine the R&D and to have a mechanized process. So it was one of the patents he put in. 
1951. By the way, Velcro comes from the French. It comes from velvet, which is velour in French, and crochet, which is hoop, hence the name Velcro. Okay, so we apply that. He created a company back in 1952. The patent was approved in 1955. The brand is becoming a brand in 1956, and nothing happened yet very much. You know, there was a very low intake of that technology, this kind of uh, strap you can you can use and time and time again. And it was only with the lunar uh, landing back in 1969, where Neil Armstrong used that in order to fasten his camera on his chest, that it became very popular. And other applications stem, athletic gloves, accessory, I know it's news quite a lot. You had uh, an American company pushing that very hard in 1983, and now you have, uh, and that uh, allows them to send that to consumers through the retail chain in the United States and, and worldwide. And today you have in an, an a diversity of industrial sectors which are using Velcro. Okay, so that's a very nice example of of, of a nature inspired material. Another example is a geeko feet. Now, the geeko feet here, you, is, uh, you have three different levels of structures. Remember the hierarchical level I was mentioning? One, which is the spatula at 200 nanometers. And the spatula form part of the spatula shaft, which is two micron wide. And that form parts of uh, the settle shaft, which is 100 micron. At the moment, people have been able to replicate the settle shaft and the spatula shaft, but not the spatula itself. And at the moment, it's too too small apparently to to make it uh, on a on a, a nanotechnology. So three level, as I said, and you, this is an example where you are using van der Waal forces. Uh, there is some interest in biorobotics and for tapes, different tapes, etc. So you've seen a very nice example where you have a robot um, um, robot geeko such as this one. Uh, so M Mark Kutowski is on the right hand side from uh, from uh, uh, MIT. So so very nice. And the, the the one on the left hand side who is actually the researcher who did all the hard work. Uh, this is basically the the, the geeko the geeko bot here. And you've probably seen some nice example where that device that as a robot goes onto very very flat uh, pieces of glass actually this is a simple way to do it if that robot was going onto a very rough surfaces it would not be able to climb and you need to have the spatula at 200 nanometers in order to make it work but for very flat surfaces you just need two layers of functionalities so it looks more, it looks formidable, but actually it's the easiest, easiest face to use. But he, what was very nice, he was using a different technique. Uh, he called it shape deposition manufacturing. And it's a very nice, very simple technique to use. It's an additive manufacturing technique where it's embedding components within the traditional additive manufacturing technique. The one we are using all the time, like spray jetting or inject printing and, and what have you. Yeah. So, Look at this thing, this kind of shape deposition manufacturing. It's a, if you are interested in bio robots, it would be certainly one uh, manufacturing process to look at. That has been done for the, especially the feet you see. Now you have less known examples. So for example, the, the use of undulating membrane. I think it's fair to say that none of us have seen fishes with propellers. Yeah, and yet we are using propellers as a way of moving uh, in the sea, don't we? Whereas animals are using undulating membrane. And it was a French guy 15 years ago who said, maybe I need to look a little bit more about this undulating membrane. And you notice that the efficiency of movement, that is the movement achieved as a function of the energy put put in, actually far superior than, than your propeller. And uh, two companies were created. One of them is called In Energy, And they are using that for two different applications. One as a way of uh, 
propelling things, and another way as as a turbine, as a way of generating electricity uh, using that system. So you see the, the picture here on the bottom left, Queensland. Another one, another thing is um, the, the, what, the company that have been using that is called Well Power. People notice that you have this kind of rugosity here on the actual wings of whales. And that has been shown actually to create less turbulence and they have been this uh, this kind of uh, let's call it serration. We could say that has been used or uh, protrusion has been used in uh, in wind turbine in order to reduce the turbulence and the shear forces active uh, on the wind turbine itself. So this is an example where you are doing what we call biomorphing. So you are using basically the actual um, um, structure itself and do a translation. In, in that particular case, the wind energy. Another example, less known example, and the L of the morpho, which is a blue, uh, a blue butterfly. And if you are to look very carefully, you have this very complicated structure here. And for quite a long time, people notice that this structure uh, created colors, yeah? what we call structural coloring. So that you do not have pigment, you are using this thing in order to create this different kind of color. And so that was interesting to look, for example, at uh, uh, structural coloring by itself uh, for textile, etc. Uh, but also as uh, for photovoltaic, in order to let some uh, some uh, uh, wavelength passing through this photovoltaic shell. But more recently, and it was a work by the French scientist Serge Berthier, he noticed that it was also a very good thermal. A radiator. You know, you could have a very good heat sink and be able to control very carefully the actual temperature of um, the surfaces for which you have put this kind of material. So you have a, an, another application which is used uh, for uh, a thermal regulator. And actually, this is why the you, this kind of butterfly never get too hot. You know, they, they, they can regulate the temperature coming from the, uh, uh, the sunny radiation. Another continuative idea that was mentioning that at the very beginning, I was talking to you about the serration, the all. You see the serration of the all here, given here, this kind of very small serration. You will find that in the primary wing of the all, which is given here. So this thing is a blow up of, this thing is a blow up of that thing here. And you see the turbulence is very much less than the eagle itself. So the counterintuitive idea is to break down your surfaces in order to make it more uh, less uh, less turbulent. So another way of saying that if you want to create a boat which are very good hydrodynamic properties, you do not want to have a very smooth boat. You want to have this little little serration in order to reduce the boundary layer. Another example, and I came back from the, the very beginning, I was mentioning this counterintuitive idea. This is a dandelion seed you see here. And there is some new computational free dynamics. And where the actual, that would be an hour presentation by itself, but my colleague at University of Edinburgh discovered that if you have filaments, like you have in a dandelion seed, this filament helps to create uh, less drag, sorry, more more um, more drag than if you had it completely solid. Another way of saying that is a, a porous membrane, essentially will give you a greater ability for that dandelion seed to travel to longer distances than a solid membrane. So this is very counterintuitive, and the reason is you have an interplay between the various filaments of the dandelion seed. So uh, Ignazio Viola has been able to demonstrate that using experiments and using simulation. And you can see some very nice interest, for example, in, uh, in micro drones, where you could spread this, uh, imagine you had a sensor as a stem of this, um, of this dandelion thing. You could suddenly drive or get this, uh, these sensors to a very wide region without necessitating any active energy in order to propagate it. Now, 
How to control it is a different thing, but certainly you can pass it to, to a very large area. Uh, for example, to look at uh, uh, control of chemicals in a, in a field or looking at uh, meteorological um, data you want to get. Think about the field twister, for example. A very fertile domain of application is architecture. It's, I will not explain in detail all of that, but architects are probably, and I'm, I'm sorry about the French, it was a French word here, but architects are the most daring people to use nature-inspired solutions for various aspects, energy, structure, flux, and also to, uh, at the town level, so what we call the, uh, the territory, how to look at the territory, and also the regulation. So the uh, not only the temperature, but also the light, the wind, etc., and so on and so forth. So if you have some example on the right hand side, you have an example from a very famous building in Ethiopia. And the bottom one is using the, the bird of parasite flower to create this flexible membrane. And this is in South Korea in Seoul. Um, this is another example, a very nice example. So where can you learn about this topic? I hope that I uh, have convinced you it was a fascinating topic. So where can I learn that, for example, at undergraduate level or postgraduate level? But fortunately, there is no such courses in the UK at the moment in nature and spine engineering. Uh, the closest you will find is one is a two years Master of Art in Biodesign, but it's many months for artists and jewelry, textile and materials in, uh, in London. Um, I'm, crying, I'm uh, putting together a course, which will start not this September, fortunately, but only in September 2021. And you have seen most of the various topics that are going to be covered on that methodology, biomaterial, uh, biodesign, and so on and so forth. If you want to know more about that, there is a, a European project called In Nature, uh, but it's mostly at the very at the undergraduate level, the pupils level, first year undergraduate, but there is some resources you can have a look. So type European project in nature and you will you will go to their web page. Now uh, my commercial break here is for those who are interested for um, uh, UK UK students, I've got a current PhD position which is all open for computer aided biomimetics. So if you are interested, you can always contact me. So in conclusion, we still need a systematic and automated methodology for problem driven uh, for the industrial take up. So the industry requires such a thing. You have biologists, zoologists, botanists, they always will be needed. You now the computer will not do that and engineers need the help of these people. It's a holistic approach. So you need to take into account um, uh, and, and I believe that approach could uh, solve a lot of problems, societal challenges, such as the scarcity of material, also the STEM gender imbalance. Um, the, we, we have uh, noticed that uh, in the seminars we were given, we have a very large representation of, the, of female gender in such a topics. And also a way to resolve the loss of trust of uh, the public towards science as well. So There's a progressive loss of trust and I think we need to do something about it. And it's a new field and it ought to be learned at school, right at the school level, let alone at university level. And we're just starting, as I said, is a new field for the 21st century. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your wonderful presentation. I hope uh, the participants enjoyed uh, your talk. And uh, we will take in some questions now, I think. Uh, anybody who has any questions, I can see Rucha putting up her hand. So Rucha, can you uh, just unmute yourself and put forward your question? Sure. Um, so first of all, you convinced us to the fact that it's an amazing and interesting session of biomedical era that we'll have. I, I just have a question about so it's very likely that the biomedical or bioengineering industry is going to be big in the coming years. Do you think there's a dark side to it? Like, do you think we could 
use the tricks from nature in order to harm nature more? Do you think that's a possibility? Um, no, I think I actually I think the contrary. I think that the more we educate industry of the importance of nature, uh, the fact that there is a lot of things which is still undiscovered, the more industry will recognize that nature is a very precious, precious resources, and that ought to be that ought to be um, conserved, that ought to be um, preserved, so to speak. Um, I think what the industry will not necessarily want to do is just harvest, uh, literally harvesting a plant of a given concept. Uh, what they want to do is they want to do the translation. So they want to be able to extract, for example, what is a protein uh, which is quite, which is so important and try to replicate that in a factory, but not necessarily collect all the plants which will be able to get that protein. So they do some synthetic composition of that uh, that protein or what have you. So I think I think it's um, I I I have I believe that by educating industry you will be able to make them aware of how important nature is uh, because there's a lot of things to be unknown so you don't want to destroy things for which for for which a solution could be used and help the bottom line as far as the budget is concerned or as far as your 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 turnover is concerned so I don't I think the contrary. All right. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Um, I think John is the next, so probably you can go ahead, John. Hi, Mark. Thank you very much for a really good uh, presentation. I'm, I'm a staff member in the School of Engineering here, and uh, it's great to hear that uh, you're developing a course um, at postgraduate level. And yeah. I just wanted to ask about even earlier at undergraduate level, um, what is your thoughts about uh, the introduction of of uh, this topic at that level also in the future? And um, are you integrating it into existing courses in that respect? I'd be really interested to hear about your thoughts on that. Um, it's um, it's a difficult one because. Um, um, in order to, to 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 tackle that field, you you need a little bit of multidisciplinarity of of uh, of, of a knowledge, and you need to have you need to be a little bit of a polymath about it. If I were to introduce something at the undergraduate level, I would probably introduce, as, as far as the engineers are concerned, maybe a, a module related to biology, to biomaterials, to uh, because we uh, we do not know as engineers, we do not know any very much you know how nature works and and I think it would be nice to have this kind of uh, leveling uh, at the undergraduate level uh, in the first instance so it's always very difficult to to go backwards so at, as a master of science level you can do that relatively easily but then how do you propagate that back is slightly more complicated um, so so my my first instinct at the undergraduate level would be to to offer a module, for example, on uh, biological living, something like that, and which cover all the, the things related to phylogeny, basic structure, DNA, the cells, um, the the various hierarchical function, and so on and so forth, and how nature makes things by itself. So that people have an understanding of it, or or trying to get to what we call advanced reading modules, which are specifically targeted to that. Um, this is another possibility as well. Uh, but uh, I do not know of anything, of any any courses in Europe doing that at undergraduate level. I might be wrong, but I do not know anything. Maybe maybe if there is an, an, a country which does that undergraduate level, that probably be in Germany. They are the most advanced in, in uh, nature inspired engineering, in my view, but I haven't looked at it very carefully, I'm afraid. Oh, no, no, it's no problem, thank you. Um, it's more, I think, that word inspiring, it's introducing the students as early as possible to this concept so that, you know, 
they're really interested in this masters that you're talking about. So uh, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Just, it, it's fantastic. So thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, John, for your question, and thank you, Professor, for answering it. Um, we'll take a few more questions. I think if anyone wants to ask any, do you have any more questions? Well, if you not have any questions, I have a specific question, Professor. Uh, sure. You talked about uh, the openings, the vacancy you have for your PhD program. So, because this new module is quite uh, interdisciplinary, as I can see, and it's relatively new as well, you don't get it uh, everything in one module. So, if you're hiring any PhD student in your lab, what are the things, uh, what are the prerequisites, basically? That you will look forward in a student that you want somebody uh, to be uh, very much excelling in biomaterials, or you want uh, electronic engineering because you want to somebody who is very good with cadence, as I as you mentioned in your talks. So, can you give us a gist like what are the things you would look at? Because this is uh, again very very interdisciplinary. Well, that that specific PhD I was mentioning, um, and that was very much a commercial break really for me, uh, an opportunity to. To extend is, is is related to computer science. So I, I would be looking for somebody who is interesting in computer science, or a computer scientist would be useful, but somebody who has also an interest on in in biology and in, in that field. Um, in, in general, I, I I have, for example, another PhD which is going to be uh, used, uh, uh, going to be fulfilled, and I, I needed to have a mechanical engineer, somebody who has was an understand good understanding of simulation tools such as uh, um, ANSYS, uh, or yeah, ANSYS uh, HFSS. Uh, I did not necessarily need to have somebody who understand about uh, biology because that's something I would expect that person to learn over the three and a half, four years of his PhD, and and he will be um, he will be associated with uh, uh, one of the best entomologists in France anyway, who will be working. So he's going to learn a lot from about insects for that particular PhD. Um, so I, I want somebody really who is passionate about it, who is very open-minded and uh, is very happy to learn about different fields. It, it puts people out of their comfort zone. You know, it's, it's, it's not a very agreeable, uh, agreeable situation to be in when you have been, you have been taught in a very specific way. And suddenly you have to uh, understand the vocabulary, the way of thinking of a totally different field. It, it can be quite challenging, but if people enjoy the challenge, that is possible. So for that particular PhD I was mentioning, um, uh, for the opening, is a, a computer scientist would probably be the best bet in my view. And it is based on already some work that my my PhD student has done. And so we are we are moving forward in creating this uh, meta methodology I was explaining before. All right, Professor, thank you so much for those insights. It was uh, very, very uh, I hope they are very helpful for any prospective PhD students. Uh, so, well, I think nobody has any more questions, I guess. And we'd like Rucha to end this session with a thanking note. Well, Rucha, you can go forward. Yeah. Um... All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I kind of have a question. I'm just going to like annoy you again um, and then I'll go to the acknowledgement sections. Um, so I would like to ask you, Professor Mark, about when you're trying to translate that kind of uh, biological knowledge of all the organisms or even just the things that we know, what are the common problems engineers or designers have that they fail to like translate it into the materialistic world? The first thing, uh, they, uh, we have been running uh, workshops uh, over the last few years concerning the meta methodology I was, seeing, I was telling you. The first thing that uh, engineers tend to do is they tend to believe they, they have already the biological solution to help them. Mm -hmm. And they, they jump straight into it. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's the way we do it. You know, we, we have a solution, we want to try it. Whereas you need to take a step back and to say, okay, this is the solution I have. I'm going to look at it at some point. I put that on the side, uh, but I need to go through the whole routine. You know, all the different uh, eight steps I was mentioning before, A, B, C, D, et cetera. Because you might be surprised of finding solution you never thought about. 
uh, in the natural world. You know, the life the life of trees. There's a lot of a uh, lot of branches, a lot of ramification there, and uh, finding a way to be able to go through all the different plants and animals, as have been do been documented by the zoologists and the botanists. Um, this is why the reason why you need computer tools it might allow you to find solution you never thought about. So you have to be very patient. Is what I think. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, so moving on to acknowledgements, of course, Professor Mark, thank you for putting up with this, uh, despite everything that's happening in the world on flames, but thank you for taking the time to do this and like inspiring us. So that was amazing, of course. And thank you again, School of Engineering, Trinity College Dublin, for giving us this excellent platform to do this. And you actually brought a lot of students from different, varieties, like, field and disciplines for this. And I hope everyone enjoyed this. So special thanks from uh, Dublin University Engineering Society. So from undergraduates and postgraduates alike, thank you so much again, Professor Mark. It was amazing. And thank you, all the people, everyone who stick to the last point. So that was amazing. So thank you again. Hope you all had a nice time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Professor.